program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with the City of Eau Claire. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. <laughs> Call to order the December meeting of the Warwick Parks Commission. <coughs> uh, first item of business on the agenda would be approval of minutes from the October 24th meeting. Um, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Yeah. Uh, yeah Chris Busky that came to talk about the Boyd Park. His n name is B U S K E, not I. I Things go wrong, we might want to look for him later. <laughs> okay. So noted. Any other additional corrections? <coughs> Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the minutes with the corrected name? Any seconds? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? What was the spelling on that name, John? B U S K E E. Okay, new business. First item is recommendation to approve McDonough Park Active Aging Design Proposal. Uh, Todd and Phil. Good evening, everybody. Um, some years back, and there's folks in the room that can correct me as to what year the conversation started. Um, we had uh, conversations with a group of folks from the Chippewa Valley Pickleball Club uh, to to uh, take a, a McDonough Park and, and create a uh, pickleball courts in McDonough Park. We we have done that. Um, we entered an agreement with the Chippewa Valley Pickleball Club, and after that amenity was added, it it sort of you know, open the question or open the idea of, of having an active aging destination within our park system somewhere. And that that that, that dialogue's been ongoing for, for a good period of time now, probably the better part of the last year. We have uh, solicited the help of a, a CBS Square, a consulting firm in Chippewa Falls to help with the design work. We reached out to the neighborhood and got some grassroots information and, and, and consensus from the neighborhood on September 13th of this year as to what, um, what how they feel about um, design and we took the elements that they had uh, spoke to uh, or in favor of and we incorporated them in the design and, and you might have seen that in the packet but tonight we have Phil Johnson from CBS Square here to to explain more detail about the design, and is uh, Marilyn Scarset as well, um, to speak to the definition of active aging uh, amenities as well. So I'll just turn it over to Phil and let him decide more. Thanks, Todd. Um, so we're going to have kind of an interactive uh, little program between Marilyn and myself, Todd, and, and Jeff at the end. Uh, my name is Phil Johnson. I'm a landscape architect at CBS Square. In my past life, I was uh, an employee of the city for 25 years. Um, they um, gave the job to Todd. Then. So uh, I retired in 2009, I think, something like that. So anyway, so it's always good to be in front of the commission again. And I promise Pat I'd make this quick. It wasn't always that way. I got the time around. He's got the hooks on here. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I wanted to start with by telling you is that um, McDonough Park was was the first park in the city that we applied the SEPTED principles. SEPTED is community policing through environmental design. It's a it's an approach or a filter that you put into uh, how you design parks and facilities. McDonough Park at that time was uh, a park that had a lot of nefarious activities going on and it wasn't good and so we looked at that park as the first park to apply these septet principles and these principles <coughs> are uh, are natural surveillance developing natural access control and affecting territorial change pretty simple you know it's confusing when you look at it the first time but there's many techniques that you apply to uh, making these things um, 
an element of the park or a functional piece of the park. <clears throat> We, we had to increase the visibility. You have a train track down there, and it was just covered with brush and understory, and that was opened up at the end of the uh, uh, roadways that butted into uh, McDonough Park. We had to increase uh, security lighting in the park. We had to do other, um, uh, we, we had to do other things to encourage people to come there on a drop-in basis. We engaged the neighborhood to serve that we got in 2006 to 2009, we did uh, we improved the access to the park. So that the end of the is it Center Street that goes into the park. The end of Center Street, we redesigned the end of that park and made a more defined entrance. Um, we created a parking lot that defined a major a limit to how far you could go in the park with a vehicle. Uh, another big uh, step in, in decreasing crime on in the park. Um, and that's what controlled the access to the east side of the park. Uh, we opened up and maintained a visual access to the park through each of the connecting streets. Very important that you have these sight lines um, into, the, into the facilities. That principle has really been applied through almost all the design principles that the city presently uses, even in the downtown area. The sight lines through the streets, you see that now at the Cannery District, you see that now on the, on the downtown uh, South Barstow area. Um, we also added, in working in constant with the police department, we increased the police presence into the park. Again, I, like I said, we added security uh, lighting, and we also added elements that would draw more people into the park. And so that was really setting the groundwork for a safe park. And McDonough was not a safe park from Eau Claire standards, at least. So that opens the door to when a group comes in and says, oh, we want to convert the tennis courts into pickleball. Well, it's, it's an acceptable place for that kind of activity now because of the improvements that were done early. Just want to set that basis for this discussion because safety is always a concern in the park and um, this, these improvements that we'll be talking about today you know, just add to improving the, the ownership that the neighborhood's taking into the park. Todd talked a little bit about the, um, I don't know if that was in the agenda, packet. The, oh, the summary of the meeting? Yes. It wasn't there? Yeah. Okay, well, if you have a copy, you don't need that, but we had this engaging meeting with the neighborhood on the 28th of, of um, September, and we wanted to start in the beginning of the project with a relatively clean slate. So what we did, take my drawings together, that's what we did. We just basically put the existing elements on there. The scribbling is me. So when we were talking to the, the neighbors, they um, kind of talked about some of the things they were hoping for in the park. This was after the pickleball uh, organization had established themselves firmly in the park. But you know, to get more feedback from um, the neighborhood, we kind of had this very engaging. It was about an hour, hour and a half meeting. Um, well attended, uh, maybe 15 people there. So that, that's pretty good for a neighborhood meeting. But if you see, you know, we're just representing what was the existing elements in there. We didn't want to presuppose some of these things too early in the process. So after the plan, after the meeting, we, we met on a number of occasions with uh, Marilyn and uh, uh, Todd and myself, and Arlen, um, Jeff, and we talked about some of the elements that came out of this discussion. And I'm going to go through each of these sections of it. But we created this overall plan again, focusing on these corridor uh, access visible points as being a very very important stuff. So we divided up basically in the sections. We've got. Uh, in a passive area as you come into the park, uh, there was a very strong feedback that we got from the neighborhood that they wanted to maintain this, this really uh, nice wooded uh, passive area, passive as in not programming it with anything. And that's kind of delineated by the parking lot that's there. Uh, but as you get moving to the east, it starts to pick up activities. 
and then when you get to the far part of the portion of the park where it starts to narrow in, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what where those opportunities are. So basically, the we start out once we get past that passive area, we get into this what I've been informed is a, a key issue to this active active aging uh, component. And Marilyn will be talking about that in a little bit. Uh, but it's the social engagement area. Um, we talked about enlarging the uh, hard surface around the pavilion. Uh, we talked about the group uh, managing the uh, drop-in or a program activities in that pavilion space and beyond that pavilion space. Uh, they wanted to run programs that people could do, uh, sponsor or uh, companies could do in and come in and have yoga or some kind of stretching classes or whatever in this area. Um, we wanted to make sure that there was an accessible linkages came from here to the other parts of the park. This whole park is a universally uh, accessible park. So we're not putting any barriers in there for accessibility. Um, also something I'm calling on this drawing a learning circle. So where there could be some uh, teaching going on of, of different things at different for, for different age groups if possible. Um, and then the other one is on the outside is the fitness equipment, of which would have beautiful views of just a stunning, stunning part of the city. I don't know how many people really know that park very well, but I see head shaking. Yeah, it's it's spectacular. And it's been underutilized and this is the exciting part about this park is that it's now being utilized and you're starting to realize some of the potential that it is. How am I doing? Okay. Uh, so as we get moving to the east, there's a youth area. And the youth area has a, a number of things. And we've talked about different locations for some of these elements within here. But the youth area is, is enhancements to the playground and making it more, uh, more appropriate size-wise. Now it just kind of occupies space, but this would be more appropriately designed. And the hot button I've been up, item now is always a zip line in there. So uh, making sure that we have enough space there. Um, and then also uh, dividing it out by age groups, top to five and five to 12. Now whether that plays out or not, I don't really know, but just from a um, uh, use perspective, you know, it's good, the, the physical, capabilities of these age groups differ significantly and putting them all in one unit is, is not a safe thing to do so that's what my recommendation is um, <clears throat> we're taking the basketball court away from this area that is parked right next to the uh, the plan is to take it from this area uh, and to move it further in so this is embedded into this youth area um, not that it prohibits anybody else from using it, but it seems that there was a want to have a, a half-court basketball there, and it gives some opportunities uh, for the pickleball group also to use it for some warm-ups. Uh, we also talked about some bocce ball areas, and that could be bocce ball, it could be a beanbag toss, it could be a you know, uh, shuffle board in the future, or whatever kinds of you know board or court or uh, activity that would want to be in this this area. Um, we are creating a buffer between, you know, the, the group area or the hard surface area and the playground area. That's not very intentional. Um, next thing is the improvements that have happened through the pickleball group. And I got I have to commend that group for for coming forward and being willing to invest in this thing because it's a it's a huge uh, startup initiative on their part that's really driving a lot of the, the uh, new discussion that's, that we've had. Uh, and these, you know, funding will be talked about to some extent today, um, but it's it's one of those great partnerships between public and private that is really the, the main step of developing parks nowadays. We do not do it generally off of uh, government funding. Um, and, it, and it does, from a SEPTED perspective, it's created that increase of use in the park. So you, you've got more people engaged, more people there, um, and that's always a good thing for the park. The other thing that we're looking at is a loop trail and some overlooks. Uh, as we get to the east, this narrows down, and then this, the intent 
here is to link into a larger trail network, uh, and that might be the key for funding on this, tying into a larger trail network that will have McDonough Park be part of the, the bigger loop or bigger section. And then, in addition to that, from a health and wellness perspective, we, we developed a number of looping systems in here that's kind of based on a person's abilities uh, or uh, mobility. They, they can utilize whatever they're capable of doing. Um, if you look at the overall plan, we've got the major arterial for the trail coming along the bank with an overlook and overlook. And then this looping is in here, and the looping is in there, and the looping is in there. And you know, if you, you, you really, if you look at all these different loops, there's probably, I think I figured a mile a little short of a mile of trail walking you can do relatively easy in a, in a circuit. So that uh, would be an asphalt trail um, and it would probably have, I don't know, we, we haven't really discussed this, but this standard trail in the city is 12 feet. Uh, whether or not it should be 12 foot, we, you know, we haven't really, that hasn't been decided. Um, and the, Magnificent, oh, that's a great spelling. Magnif magnificent uh, views of Dell's Pond. Uh, I'm going to use that from now on. But it's, uh, it's just did. <laughs> but it's just so stunning. I mean, what a beautiful, beautiful place that is. Um, there's also potential for other activities within these within these pockets, uh, and you could you could bring back a, a scale back and that uh, 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 a use like disc golf. So you, if you wanted to do that, you could add, this would be an area that you could do little things in it um, or yard or old yard games. There's also a discussion about a new restroom over on this side. So it would serve the people on the trail as well as people in the, pot, in the pickleball area and walking the trails. And there's that existing restroom that would serve the west side of the park. Um, and one of the reasons that this park is going to be successful is because of the element of active aging. And I'd like Marilyn to kind of pick it up from here. Some of you have heard this story a few times because I've been kind of all over the community talking to different groups. Um, I know exactly when this started. I was in Todd's office and he was showing me the drawing of the playground equipment that you were putting in Carson Park. It was a beautiful drawing. And then I said, but I don't like it. And he was like, what do you mean you don't like? I said, what have you got integrated in this playground for adults and grandparents, people who might have spinal cord injuries to engage and interact with other people? It's so easy to make that happen. I said, I just walk the mall and I go past the, the Mayo Clinic play area for kids. Why don't they have one activity in there that adults, when they're there with their kids, that they could be doing some fitness activities and modeling good behavior. If you go around our community, most of the parks, we got great parks for kids, for young adults, but most of our parks we've turned adults into spectators, and the only activity they're getting is probably playing on their phones. I mean, think about how many places can families really go and participate collectively in an activity. Or where does someone go that has a person that has Alzheimer's to get activity? Where do seniors who go that are afraid to walk on the bike trails alone go to get activity? I mean, there are lots of ways that you can take a park integrated and if you've been over to Europe at all like in Switzerland um, Spain France a lot of them active aging is the way almost all of their parks are where they integrate a ton of activities a lot of them are low impact activities activities anybody can do um, there are a lot of activities you can do by yourself you don't have a partner um, and that's exactly what we're going to try and do I think with this park um, some of the activities you talked about like bocce ball Great game, you can play it, your grandparents can play with grandkids, you can remove the end section, people in wheelchairs can use it. Trying to integrate more activities that people can do, um, whether it's grandparents with grandkids or people that have other you know, physical challenges. We also plan on putting in just some simple bars, all right, in that fitness area that shows some fitness machines, where we can do all sorts of strength, flexibility training, um, there are a lot of activities in here that will be geared, geared to like fall prevention and just flat out staying healthy. Um, if you go back to that one, maybe the first slide of the park, 
towards my clicker there, the guy. You can go back to the park. Whoops, that went too fast. Let me just walk through this a little bit. So the idea here is in this first area when people come in, is this whole notion of having the fitness activities. You're talking strength, flexibility, balance, all those things that will help people maintain functional fitness, to help keep them in their homes longer, try and prevent obesity, um, depression, all those sorts of things. We know with our seniors, some of the biggest problems are they get frail because they don't exercise. A lot of them get isolated. When they get isolated, they get depressed. So if we can get people engaged in more activities, this area hopefully will do it. You can put on classes in fall prevention there. You can put on stretching classes. You can bring in the health care services to do health screenings. This area could become a real vibrant people where people could come down and maybe if we're lucky get a few food trucks to come in occasionally where they can come and meet and eat and socialize. So that's the key of that part. Again, as you go down, trying to integrate activities that everybody can do. Speaking to pickleball, I mean, that's really what transformed everything. What's that? Oh, that's right. The pickleball courts, the pickleball club has raised uh, approximately $140,000 that they've put into this. So the pickleball club took the first six courts, which are old tennis courts, and thanks to some donations, resurfaced that into the first six, raised the money for the next six. We also have now the money to top coat the courts with that colored texturized surface. And we are paying for this entire road and these parking lots, which that contract has already been signed. That's what the Pickleball Club has done to McDonough, and that's really what launched it. And if you watch Pickleball, it's an ideal sport for this part. Because when you're playing Pickleball, first of all, you've got that first step to the ball. It's the first step you have to take to prevent a fall. The reaching for the ball, again, another one of those fall prevention things. You reach out, try and grab something. You have people working on cognitive skills. I mean, most of us have trouble even scoring in pickleball. But the ideal thing about pickleball is you can come as an individual. I bet 95% of our players show up by themselves. A lot of them who have lost spouses, a lot of them who don't know people, they can come there and get a game. If you're a tennis player, you're not going to play tennis unless you have a foursome or a twosome. Most people are going to golf without golfing. This is one area where you can come down by yourself and get mixed into a game. The other thing that's neat about it is I have family saying, boy, this is the first game I've been able to do with my teenage kids. Because pickleball's in the middle schools, they love it. We had a six and a half, sorry, he'll probably tell me he's seven now, six and a half year Christopher all summer, hanging out at the pickleball courts and had a blast. So to see that place where you see people actively engaged, it's crossing all lifespans. I know one of the parks and rec people retired, lost 40 pounds for first year playing pickleball. We probably have more artificial joints on that court <laughs> at any one time than any other place. Because you can play it if you even have limited mobility. So the idea is to put in all these games, and a lot of them are just green space games. You know, you can put in Coob, you can put in uh, you know, other exercise stations, the bean bag toss, you can put in Knox hockey on a table. A lot of places will just use ropes and do giant checkers and chess. So I think if we can put more activities in it, we've also had requests just to have tables for card games where people can just come out, get outside, and play cribbage. Making this that kind of a park that will have something for everybody. And even if you don't like something, you might go to a different station while someone else is doing something else. So we're trying to get the social connection, make it something that's free and accessible. It also helps, I think, that it's in a low-income neighborhood that doesn't have the resources um, to get very active. So it's got those things going. And then, to take it even further, the um, I have a letter here from Beaver Creek. They're excited about possibly putting in Uber trails. They agreed to pay for it, sponsor it, check them. And the garden club, we have some people interested in maybe one of those spaces out there being like a butterfly garden, uh, possibly some elevated gardens for the seniors that love to garden. They've now moved into apartments, and they've lost that ability. So the whole idea about these parks is total engagement from youth, youth to death, basically. That there should be something for everybody. It should be a safe place for everybody. And for like caregivers, where do caregivers take people today? To get outside and have some fun. I mean, it's really, it's hard to find those places. So hopefully even somebody that has a spouse with Alzheimer's can come down here, walk loops, always be supervised, and you don't have to worry about them. So that's the, the hope. 
My other hope is that in every budget that comes through now, we see more active aging equipment in all of our parks. Um, but hopefully if we can prevent illness and prevent a lot of these health issues by having these type of integrated parks, um, we'll be helping our community in the long run. So that's what we're trying to do with this thing. Thanks, Mary. And I also got letters, so I'll leave with you, from the uh, Aging and Disability Center and the community, uh, what's the community? Healthy, healthy Communities Group that have also endorsed this project. So I'll leave those with you there. We have broken down some of the funding possibilities for this and just that in a little bit, but <coughs> recreation staff about it. But this park is going to be successful only because it's going to have partners. People are going to be buying into it and contributing over time. Um, I just finished another project that was 50% funded by outside private funds um, and state grants. This, this project has the ability to go for state grants through the stewardship program, and it also has the ability or the uh, potential of things like block grants because it's in a low and moderate income area. Uh, so there are granting programs that would, would, you know, would the park would benefit from. And obviously, the, the ongoing nature of private fundraising as somebody gets another passion that they have, like Marilyn has, uh, to raise money and it might be partnering with Mayo like they did in, in their own park and create some of those fitness facilities out there. Um, I'll let Jeff kind of handle the schedule here. Um, I've broken it down, uh, maybe if you just want to start to do that. So moving forward, uh, our plan is to take uh, the plan commission on January 14th. Public hearing, and then eventually to the city council on uh, the January 22nd and 23rd meeting, which would be the second meeting in January that we'd be meeting. Um, and then basically, the the agreement that we have with the group is to fundraise. Um, you don't have to fundraise for everything right away. As, as money comes in, and we have the ability as Marilyn was saying on one part we're going to be doing the, the uh, drive in the parking lots next year. And then also we're going to be doing resurfacing the, the uh, pickleball courts and the painting. I think it was the painting of the pickleball courts in 2019. But as funding comes available, um, uh, I, I should back up and say we did, a, we did get a $20,000 grant from the uh, hometown health grant for the active aging. So that's one part of that we have already started in the grant process, but also as the, uh, the private funds come in, we will look at the amenities that we will uh, put in right away. Um, and we'll prioritize what those are. There may be some that we'll put in sooner than others. The trail might be a little bit, be one of those that uh, would be a little later because I think that's earmarked for a later year to bring that trail around the, uh, around the park. So um, that may be something that would be a little bit later, but we can put in some of the other amenities uh, as funding becomes available. Um, 2020, you know, is, is, uh, we have there, we could go into more engineering design completed and look at a phase one for the summer of 2020. Um, again, as I mentioned, <clears throat> we have several amenities that we listed here. The likelihood is that we're not going to do it all at one time. I mean, if the money is there, we'll do it. If we somehow get a large grant or a large donation from somebody, and, and the, it's within our cost structure, we'll certainly go ahead and do that. In the future, too, um, I will be putting in some requests in the, in the city CIP for some of the active aging parts that we had uh, that Phil had on the uh, side that the public is going to uh, uh, fund on the, on the trail system. And, well, the trails, the playground, the tree plantings, benches, basketball court, natural air. So some of that stuff is already in the CIP. 
uh, but some of it will also be added to future years uh, into the CIP. Um, and then in 21 could be a phase two, again, depending upon the money that's available. And then 2022 would be a final phase. And again, this can be adjusted dependent upon the funding that we have available. We will continue to, to apply for grants. We've been very successful with that. Um, this, this item seems to be a very good applicant for, for grants. So there's several grants out there. Um, our business analysts will continue to work on trying to get additional funding for that. Do you have a total? We haven't priced out all this, have we? Yeah. At this point, we wanted to bring this to the committee, get your feedback. Uh, if you say, well, let's nix this or, or add that, then we can come back with a revision. Not come back, but add that revision into it and then associate some uh, opinions of cost on that. And that's kind of what I was, kind of, that's the next step of my work. So Typically, no. when you get into the design part, this is more conceptual, so it's showing you know, Get your feedback on what you, your thoughts are on this, along with city council and the public. And then when we get into the design, I think at that point we'll have some cost estimates of what those amenities will I would think by the January point. meeting, I'll give you a, what's called an opinion of probable cost, a cost estimate, because these are just you know ideas at this point. We, we have to give it some form, and then I've got enough information to estimate. You know the distances of trails. You know the cost of the building that. So January system. <clears throat> well, it looks like a lot of thought went into it. I applaud you for what's happened so far. <clears throat> Does that take into account as many of these items on this list as you could? And kind of there was one or two items that we weren't able to incorporate, but uh, you know. <clears throat> No, I, I think we've done pretty well to get all of them. Uh, part, most part of them. one activity that wasn't on the list that I heard from our vets is that notion of getting that, is it dark ball? It's evidently fairly active, but they thought that might be something potentially to see if we could work in, that they could yeah. and gather and do some things. They did, they were kind of mixed, mixed me on the disc golf, and uh, they did suggest snowshoeing. Mm -hmm. But the trails are pretty much intended to be plowed. Is that correct? So, you know, it's really the primary recreation is going to be walking. And that's mm -hmm. popular in all the trails. Um, and we're, we're talking you know, Nordic walking. We're talking about the Walk with Ease program. We've got like eight instructors now trained to, to teach that course down there for people with arthritis and mobility issues. Um, so I think it'll be a way to get people really moving. You know, the, and we've talked about this. Marilyn and Marilyn and myself we talked about this is really a template uh, that could be applied in, in a manner, shape, or form in other parks in the community. Uh, neighborhood parks have gone through a significant transition over the last 25 years. Uh, utilization isn't there, but the facilities are. And so uh, if this hits, hits a threshold where it's, uh, it's not able to hold the number of people that want to use it, instead of you know, continuing to add there, it might create an opportunity for uh, these kinds of activities in another park. When you say trail, an extension of the trail, which trail are you speaking of? It's, it's not actually there yet. Uh, there, we have a, so we have that uh, on the Open, open space and, yeah. I guess my uh, main question is, is it the bike trail? This would be uh, part of our overall simply? recreational trail system. So it would extend all the way around uh, Del Del's Pond. And there are some uh, areas to the east and the west that we still have to somehow obtain some easements or land, but the intent is to go all the way around Del's Pond. It's a, it's a dirt trail going on. It's kind of a yeah that's yeah. been developed. But with this, the trail on this bluff liner, basically the backbone on this this whole design, would eventually link up on this end with uh, Western Avenue, 
improvement trail in Western Avenue. And this would eventually link up with um, Mount Simon Park. And I'll and then the, uh, to the high bridge just north of this campus. So I guess where my question is leading is there will be some older people who are intimidated by trying to walk on a trail with bicycles. Mm -hmm. So will this be a trail where you are, I mean, whenever you say recreational trail, I assume you mean multimodal. Mm -hmm. And so would it be that kind of trail, or would it be a trail where really it would be? I would assume, I, I, I can assure you that this piece would be to be eligible for the funding that we'd be looking for, and then it would be built to the specifications of the minimum okay. 12 feet wide. That would be a multi-use multi trail. I think, I, think, I think Phil mentioned too that these, these looping um, trails, these connecting trails, that, that may not be, and that would be more, um, that would be more inclined to a piece, possibly a single use one. We were talking about they can really about the sidewalk with the intent being to get people, you know, more walking and not to commingle. It's really tough to commingle bikes with walkers, especially with older senior walkers would not be a good necessarily good mix. So would it be possible to do a second more of a walking path next to the trail on that side? A thought. Just, sure. I mean, you think about like okay. if you went to Duluth, they have both of them. like they have the trail that you're meant to be running or riding bikes on, and then the walking or they put um, a boardwalk or something. Possibly making it wider to begin with, Meredith, mm -hmm. and then painting a lane, you know, designating lane for the walking and bike use, the parking space on the side. That would be a likely compromise. Mm -hmm. I'll just add on to that again because if it's like you're saying, if you uh, older walker probably doesn't like being on the path and that outer. I like the idea of the inner path where you could like have yeah, roll the right. loose, but if you have to have half of that be on the outer path, that would cross with the bikes. But yeah, if you're making it a little wider, you know, out of lines and walking, biking, right. that could keep the isolated and encourage full looking experience. Um, um, I got two concerns with the plan that only uh, the area east of the parking lot, the 24 flat parking lot here? Yes. Okay. Right now we're showing that uh, trees and other area there. And I know when we have our tournaments, we use that for overflow parking. Parking is a big issue in that area. You can't really park on the streets. Right. And so if that's at least that first loop section there, that's <coughs> got trees in it, that would make it very difficult to accommodate the number of people that we, we had 123 players, probably another 50 spectators. So as Marilyn mentioned, the majority of those folks are driving individually. And count the number of parking slots that we have available there. I don't know how we would accommodate well, that. We, Ron, we could double this row here just with, uh, you know, parking, you know, nose to nose. These trees are called out, they're really just that's on, on okay, so take more than just another lane. So we would, we would, we could push the trees. You know, if there is planting, push them east to allow for additional parking, overflow parking. Okay. I, I don't see the need for hard surface parking, but no, I overflow no. periodic. Yeah, the surface actually works just fine, and I don't. We think would that keep we that in mind when we would be putting plant, you know, planting that area. Up. Sure. No problem with that at all. The other issue I have concerns with is the um, basketball court. I think there needs to be a basketball court in this park, but located next to the pickleball court, again, is going to eliminate um, that eight parking lot. And we fill up, if you go there any day during the week, we fill up all of these spaces, and any open spaces would be in that initial parking lot now. So. By moving that basketball court there, we're going to eliminate really that parking um, as far as access to the pickleball club players. Are you seeing, you know, are the basketball players, you know, utilizing the parking lot now, or are they walking in from the neighborhood? I, I, I no, they're they're utilizing the parking lot. And it, in fact, they don't just play basketball, though. I see them even exercising regularly on that. So from a location standpoint, to me it would be more ideal to have it closer to 
the you know, fitness equipment and the budget ball area there on either side there should be space to accommodate that and then you would draw the parking to go into the bigger parking lot there oh, to, if you're on the west side players, yeah so if use this parking lot for that yep You know, if physically, I, does the geography allow for that to be located anywhere else? I, you know, again, this is conceptual. I think these parts and phases are 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 carved in stone yet. But you know, take that your comments under advisement. And if, you know, if there's a way we can make it work, certainly would. If, if, uh, but I, I know that the neighborhood was real. You know, they were real adamant about. Increasing this plaza social gap. Sure, I think all that could be done. They were dialed in pretty good on that. And actually, the courts in the condition they are now, they're out beyond resurfacing. It's a total right. redo. So <coughs> when we redo, we'll have to look carefully at where we cite that. I, so, I, I personally think it fits in real well here. Um, it's a little bit of a poke to walk from here to there. but. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen, and I think what we'll end up doing, particularly, I don't see it impacting the daytime as much, but it will the night players okay. come in. And we literally fill that, the big uh, 24 lot, the 9 and the 8, throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I've, I've seen it. You know, I think Phil will do that too. If this park is it has limitations. When we reach the carry capacity of what we're trying to do in this park, we might have to look at another location for a more pickleball or a more amenities. I mean, I, I, I like the idea of the active aging destination because it is something that we currently underserve. I, 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 feel, I, I'm strong, I feel very strong. Yeah, I think the pickleball club totally agrees with that, too. Uh, we want to mm -hmm. see that. I'm just thinking in how best we can accommodate flow of the park mm -hmm. by where we locate. Right. And, I, and I think that's that's critical going forward too. I mean, again, this design is conceptual, it's fluid, but the last thing we would want to do is shoehorn any of these elements in there and handcuff the user or have a conflict of use once, because once we put it in the ground or it's more mm -hmm. pavement, the park scheme, then we're stuck with it. That's certainly something that we, you know, when we start to finalize the details, we, Mike? Yeah, I, I speaking on behalf of the Pickleball Club and the 220 members that we have, I would like to see the plan push forward for the restrooms. We had talked about putting in portable restrooms and closed in concrete. We understand how the city has pulled the, the pumping process. So we would like to see uh, that, again, we have 220 people that are playing there. That one restroom down at the other end, that needs to be improved if we're going to move forward with this. But we need to see uh, if the city can move forward more with the restrooms uh, down by the pickleball courts we've got uh, located now, because there are a lot of people that uh, would use those. Mm -hmm. And currently, we don't have restrooms in our capital improvement project for this, but that's, that's, a, that's a process. But you know, we annually sit down and look at um, our capital improvements, and, and it's a, usually a five-year march to the front of the line for amenities. Mm -hmm. But again, if there's if there's you know input if there's there's demand there's 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 you know conversations with our constituents i didn't see it on your your yeah. step one two three four two two twenty five you know i think this should be uh step one period to get this thing done for the rest of the rest of the rest of the second sorry uh, thank you <coughs> i lost my voice uh, is it the intention uh sun up to sundown or would there be lighting there at night, the courts and the walking trails, or would it close at, at sundown? Well, I can tell you I'm not raising any more money for, <laughs> for, for some of that stuff. Do I see it envision that potentially down the road happen that we get a group it's just like Howard Ridge, you know, ended up raising funds so people could ski after work? That potential, I think, is, is always there. I think security lighting is always good. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Right. But I think. The most of the use is sun up to sundown. Sure. The most of it. Mm -hmm. I sort of have two questions for Ron. You said you can't park in, on the streets. Why can't you park on the streets? You can't cross the railroad tracks. 
the railroad runs through here? So the railroad tracks parallel the entire length of the park, and the railroad police patrol that. But we've had members actually get tickets. Yeah, they consider it trespass. And, and a big fine. What? How many days of tournaments do you, do you have? How many days do you need that over at Park? <clears throat> well, right now, um, one. We're looking at probably two. So, as opposed to vote more of the park to overflow parking that's only needed occasionally, is there a nearby place that you could run a shuttle from? Well, the cost of doing something like that would be, right now, when we do a tournament, we are investing $2,000 in upfront costs for things like our park application, our liability insurance, and the Sure, but I always think it's good to consider it when but we don't we don't make that much money. We, we barely break, you know, we might make $2,500 or $3,000 total in entry fees. And if you already have $2,000 in expenses, there's no way that we could arrange to have a shuttle. Well, I mean, there are different ways to figure that out. I'm just saying, you know, how many days does your need for parking vastly increase? There's a small number of days that maybe there's an alternative. I think it's a creative suggestion. Did you have a little bit well? about that area? Though. That really is a, a field right now. So I think it's just a case of where the trees are planted could easily handle it. When there's not parking there, you can still put coop in there. You could do all sorts of activities. You could still be in that area. So it's just, it's like just an open field that easily could, could be multi-use. Where you put yeah, activities in it and when, you know, you have a big tournament. There's a lot of room here. Park. There's a lot of, there's a lot of country lot of between there. here and here. How large is that park? I I do know that let's see we're about we're about 800 feet just from this point to here so boy we're probably close to a couple thousand feet to we'll get down to the bar just to, as to what's shown on the sands from nine to ten acres size at least but as Pat mentioned it's very long. Uh, it widens out for the pickleball, but then it narrows down as you go to the east there. Right. And it goes down just close to the cemetery. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So there's a lot more park than people, I think, realize that. It. Yeah, it's just a it's just a footpath through that area now. And certainly, opening up. And I, I do know that neighborhood representative that came to the meeting east of there, they're they're excited to see the development. Um, so there, there is one bathroom there. Right? Is that right? There's a That's bathroom correct. there now. And where is it on the map? Right here. Okay. It's on the south side of the, of the building. Um, this area here, we don't have a lot of waiting room either because there's there's the drainage the sept, the drainage field for the, the restrooms. This has to be a, a septic system because we the railroad wouldn't let the city put sanitary under the railroad. So and same thing will have to happen over here. So there's there's a need for a um, so there's there's some requests for a second bathroom maybe on the other side is that right? Yeah, there's one stall. Yeah. There's a yeah. request is over here. Well, well, that's, let that's me mention just mm -hmm. one thing. You're talking about a an older population. I'm just trying to get. So for them to get to the pickleball course to the one bathroom and it is just one bathroom sometimes is less convenient than using all the bathrooms that are just over the edge of that hillside. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not familiar with so, the parks. I'm just well, no, it's just, I mean, they're finding here. trees and they're yeah. going behind yeah. trees because yeah. um, um, some of the folks that are older and have trouble with urinary incontinence and other activities, getting another bathroom for that large use there would be, would be really helpful. And so is there, um, are there any sort of plans for looking at the CIP and what, what can be possible for that? Or is there fundraising, plan, private fundraising plans for that? Or are we talking about our capital improvement plan? Um, we currently don't have it in the process, but we, we start that process in March. We could look at, does, does a restroom here, <coughs> idea of a restroom here piggyback some of the other stuff that we've had in the queue for a while? Mm -hmm. We can certainly look into that. Um, Sourcing funds. We, we do have $5,000 set aside to buy 
two handicapped accessible porta potties. But anybody who has worked with seniors who are in a wheelchair when you have to go in and assist them, it's less than ideal. Is it, does it relieve stress? Yes, but in the long run, it just really is filled with a lot of active aging where people have to take young kids into a bathroom or seniors, you know, ideally you want a, a more substantial restroom facility there. I think there's a great idea, a lot of great components, uh, and I, I'm just a little fearful that we're maybe putting too much into the uh, into the mix here, and that uh, we're trying to serve lots of different populations, and maybe at the expense of really not not building a facility or a portion of facility that is really well designed and, and will serve people well for a long time. And so I, I'm sure you'll continue to tinker with this and look at where where things could fit and, and all of that. But if you had to eliminate one thing just to create a little more space, and when we're talking about parking and we're talking about people gathering and activities, uh, the one thing that I think uh, would go, if I would do that, would be basketball. I think there's a lot of places that people can play outdoor basketball. Uh, and maybe, just don't need that with all the other things going on in that park. Maybe you don't need a hoop to kind of have a park. We did it, we did the this proposal downsized that to a half a park, so it isn't yeah. actually taking out the space that we currently have occupied over here. It's almost this full length there. So we have reduced that. I would, you know, good suggestion, but I, I given it, that that neighborhood, the, the availability of, of recreational opportunity. I would caution that. I would, I would caution that. Um, what was interesting when we met with the neighborhood, and this is usually, things usually go in an opposite direction. They were absolutely thrilled about paved trail, more hardscape, and parking lots. And usually, the, most of the groups that, that, that I'm hearing from is we want more soft space, green space, trees, less hardscape. But considering the, the the active aging element. They want predictable, reliable surfaces to to migrate on, as opposed to un, un, unpredictable terrain. So, but that was kind of a, that was a, a switch that I didn't see coming. I thought it might. Well, they definitely are real strong. They feel real strongly about this area right here. Mature trees and then and this new shed right here is really spectacular. And maybe a picnic bench or a a picnic grill and something like that and here's okay but that was all but they definitely want us there the neighborhood is excited about is as excited as the, the folks from active aging is just you know making more of a pause there yeah, if you want to play hoops you're up in the depth neck of the woods which is a long fellow school playground and lots of hoops uh, versus just one at, at this uh, the basketball court is fairly used. I think you pick a ball, there's my Well, a couple of things I think you're forgetting about is this is a transient area. I mean, we see transients coming through here using that bathroom consistently when we're playing pickleball. They have their backpacks on, they're, they're, uh, they come in in these sloppy cars, they park up there, they live up there. Also, the people in the neighborhood. You will find them over at that park charging up their cell phones using the bathroom that they don't have in their own homes. So there's a lot of use of that one restroom. And in the past, it's been destroyed three or four times a year. So if we're looking at restrooms, you know, we're looking at, you know, we looked at portal bodies, but we got to look at some really permanent bathrooms up there. And the other thing is, a lot of people walk their dogs up there. And we, we, Big borrowed the garbage cans from the city, and it's now full of dog poop because the people going by throw their dog poop in. So we're we're serving that nation there too. But I just want you to know that there's a lot of transients. I don't know if there's on an app or something like that, but you see a flow through of people there continually every day. And I play six days a week, and they're there. Tom, if I could also um, some of the early discussions that we had with. Maryland and Harlan, uh, you know, kind of napkin 
sketches of what was going here. It was early draft. It, but, and I think Jeff's seen that. He said, pump the brakes, folks. Whoa, this is too much. So this, this is actually, it does look like a lot, but actually, I think with the feedback from the neighborhood, we feel good about this, and the neighborhood does as well. And, and I, I don't think I don't think it's it's jam, but if, you know we would be cautious that you know go any bigger than what you're kind of seeing here, certainly. But yeah, we had there was we, it was loaded. It was <coughs> Jeff kind of had to scaled back, club me over the head and say stop, stop, stop. <coughs> but it was it was a good conversation. Kurt? Yeah, I was just going to echo Tom's comment too on that line that. You can't try to be all things to all people, include everything just because you mentioned it. Um, I was wondering about the learning area. If that were Beaver Creek, I would for sure want one, but I, I just wonder how much they really get used as a learning area. And if we had to eliminate something, that might be something that really doesn't get used much for its intended purpose. I think Bill's got that figured in right here and amongst this, this plaza of folks here. You know, and very well may not come to fruition. Susan? Well, your discussion, I think the, the plan, the philosophy of it sounds great to me. But I, I just wonder, and it's just because I don't know, um, on a, we've done a lot of parks projects of late, and there are they almost always depend on a considerable amount of uh, private fundraising by um, interested parties. Are there any of the parks that have been under construction or renovation recently where it kind of stalled out at some point and some things didn't get finished? <coughs> Not that I can say. The one that I, the one that I recall was the Angel of Hope in Buffington was the one that had bigger plants. That was a <coughs> smaller element within a bigger space. Um, and that's and what you see out. there is they lost the steam and it, they had a great start and it just kind of fizzled out. And that's that's quite a few years. I mean, that's 15, right? 20 years ago. Other than that, it was pretty successful. The people, I think, the city is good at saying if, if we're making the commitment, you're making this commitment. So there's a lot more dollars up front uh, than just a piece of paper. Okay. Do I, do I just oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Is that the answer to that, Phil? Well, I just want to make this, when you talk about like why the pickleball courts are popular, it's because it's a dedicated space that draws people from all over. I don't think you want active aging parks everywhere because part of it is you want to have a few of them so it draws a lot of people so they can socialize and get engaged because you want to go someplace and no one's there because they went to some other park so when you're talking about how many of these do i envision i mean this is a great start to see how it goes and to test a number of things and then eventually it's it's like dog parks you get one you find out the interest and more people that are willing to step up they're willing to put money into a second one and that's how it'll probably continue but I don't think you want to dilute it and have a lot of them because then you dilute the people that show up to use it and then it takes away some of the interaction. Okay. Um, going back to the fundraising piece, um, in the past we've, um, I think that we've asked groups to finish fundraising before the city makes their investment, is that right? Typically yes. when yeah. the funds, you know, funds are on deposit in the Community Parks Association, then mm -hmm. Project, we begin with the construction drawing, you know, to, you know, take the design to construction draw, drawings, shop drawings, uh, suitable for bidding, and we, we, the city does the bidding, but, you know. Let's is that how much breakfast this, this project is going to work two years? Is the That's how I would see this. So all of the Well, we, in, stages, in this yes. one here, because there's so many amenities that we're looking at here, we would likely phase it in, just like the schedule showed that we would have okay. phase one, phase two, and then the final phase. So that's Again, all dependent on fundraising and money. If you, um, 
it say not saying that this is going to happen. The cricket ball folks have done a really good job of fundraising. Um, if if for some reason the fundraising did fall short and maybe the last phase was not completed, do you think that um, it, it it would feel like a finished project still? Sure, because we we're, we're going to phase it into the point of what makes sense at a certain phase. So if the last phase doesn't get done at a point, it's not going to make the, the park look incomplete. It'll still look complete in regards to the active agent and the other amenities that we're looking at. And just to be clear, the pickleball club is not going to be doing the total fundraising for these yeah. projects. We've got um, $140,000 invested into yeah. what we're doing right now. Is active aging and pickleball are you guys two different groups? We are. Okay. <laughs> and the, the, the other thing that we're really pushing on this grant for, I mean, there's a lot of money out yeah. there for, for this type of amenity. And we've been successful almost to $8 million so far that in the last year and a half is what we've been able to give to grants. And I see an opportunity here for, for additional grants. Besides the $20,000 we have already got, significant more to be able to construct this. And I, I, I agree with Jeff. This concept of the demographic that this project targets will score fairly favorably on grant applications due to the fact that we don't have a whole lot like that going on now. It's not as if we're building a second neighborhood park or playground. playground. Yeah. Yeah. I would say I would also say that my dad went to Carson Park the other day and he was all all up in that that playground. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna try to ask if anyone more discussion on this. If yes, Ron. Well before we do I would like to move we accept the project but allow for some of the modifications that we've discussed. The, Reworking the plans for the parking and relocation of the basketball court. Where do you propose to I think there's space um, between where the bocce ball courts and the fitness equipment is, both on the north and the south side, either way. Where is it in the Where the bocce ball court and the, on the north and south sides of that area right in between there, the greens. You show them some green space there. That's where the current basketball court is right now. And this is actually smaller, so it should be able to space-wise fit in there and still accommodate that. That would draw people, like I said, into that current primary parking lot. They want to utilize those courts. And I think it also adds to potentially that you know, the activating area with a basketball court. That's not a a young person's exclusive item to use. <laughs> but I think with with Phil's help, um, we'll tweak and modify to the extent to the extent that the property allows us, but yet not losing sight of what we're hoping to see. You know, what, what the neighborhoods endorsed us are and what, mm -hmm. what you know, the actual dangers are interested in. Those two changes really don't affect the cost. Right. So <clears throat> whether it's here or there or whatever, I think that's, that can be managed and, uh, without really tweaking the plan and just making sure that the notes are clear on Because there's other things I've been talked about. This is not the last kick. Obviously, there's there's many many uh, discussions that will be happening, uh, and there'll be things coming and going in this plan. Uh, but it's a starting point, and that's I think I'm sensing that that seems like a pretty solid plan for a starting point. That's what I'm here. With extra um, impervious surface, is there going to be any? What's the riverbank or the, the water bank look like there? Is there? I assume that there's like 
trees or it's, some sort the of The bank is all it's wood, it's quite steep and wooded. And it's wooded, you don't have, my question is you don't have any um, concern about any sort of like, like polluted runoff that might enter the we water? We would have, development would include stormwater yeah. management plans as well. That, that's all part of what, when, you know, okay, the funds are here, now we take over and make sure we, we cover all those bases as well. Okay. Hey, Tom, yeah, yeah. Um, concerning Ron's comment, uh, I mean, how finalized is this plan? This is kind of the active in work plan that though it's not finalized at this point, it's sort of the chain? Oh, yeah. So, master plans typically are uh, become a throwaway plan as we work down further. <laughs> You know, of, of planning that I've done over the years, uh, you know, probably 60% of them uh, look totally different than what they started out as. Uh, but it's really trying to establish some of the basis for programming of the spaces. And that's, you know, whether the space is here or there, it, it really establishes that these are the important elements of the park. You could do it in a narrative, we started out in a graphic. We'll back it off into a narrative, and those things will be your cost items. And that's what you'll take forward. Um, you know, we could have had this discussion with just narrative as well. So, uh, Ron, regarding your comment, I mean, I don't think it's to the level of an amendment, but your comment's been made and will be included in the motion? Well, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it's a good point that uh, take the notes and include comments of changes and alterations. But my concern would be when you take it next to the plan commission, you know, if you utilize the same image, that'll be the image that goes forward and the same thing when it goes to the city council and then ultimately becomes a plan. In anticipation of this, we did mark out an area and call it overflow parking there. Uh -huh. And we didn't feel that the, the redoing of the plan for that point was going to change materially what the discussion is, if that's the case. I would have to put another level of effort into it. I'm just uh, hoping that you know, that minor modification as to placement uh, doesn't really upset that point of the approval process. When we go to the Plan Commission and City Council, we'll let them know what the recommendations of water waste parks was. So that will be noted during our presentation with the uh, Plan okay. Commission yeah, um, one thing we didn't talk about was the view from up there, which is tremendous. That was mentioned, but um, if I recall correctly, there's like one view corridor of the picnic table, maybe another small view corridor where there's a bench, but for that much lineage along that steep bank, there might be a good reason to open up a few more view corridors. And the view corridors are we have generally them. all aligned with the street terminus, you know, that way. You know, and we, we are certainly going to want to, you know, keep that somewhat blue, but yeah, we're right. The, the, those are pretty significant blowouts to the meeting, for sure. Like that are down <coughs> that are there already, but you're, are you adding to We're it? showing them here. And we've got one oh, here. here. I'm sorry. I'm showing them here. I'm sorry, I didn't see all Yep, the, the, here's one, there's one, I think one more. Yeah. This one's generally here already. Yeah, okay. We installed that primarily on that last over the last week. Yeah. Okay. And Todd's work that they've done, sometimes to maintain that by removing plants causes more maintenance, that uh, clearing the understory and limbing it might be the more desirable new corridor because then you can sustain it easier. Sometimes um, lifting the can lifting the can is provides you that same look and still and it's a lot easier to maintain. Because every every shoreline in Eau Claire wants to have trees on it. That's what it wants. Yeah. Two. I don't think Ron mentioned this when he made his most of the things he talked about with the idea of um, doing something with the trail when you were working on the trail so there'd be a park for pedestrians oh, okay. separate from the bicycles. That's good. You could also have call this out as a dismount zone. You do that down at the university where 
if you're riding into this zone, there's a sign here that says dismount, walk through. I mean, that's, that's another way of accommodating. Is that um, one thing that, that, that green tinted area? Is that for sure the full extent of the park or to the north? And you include some of that steep bank as part of the park? Well, we had the topographic survey when we mapped this out, and we, we didn't want to have that, you know, it's pretty much within 10 feet of a drop. So we didn't want to get too close to the edge of the bank. So, yeah, that's. But if you wanted to have uh, some hiking trail zone in there, is that? You can kind of see where the cuts are down through here. You know, where that the tra fish traverse, yeah, they basically. kind of create the, these traverses that go down there. Uh, so, okay. and as you get this more popular, it's probably going to have more of those. Okay. It's a fairly steep uh, bank. There are a couple cut in trails, yeah. Yeah. actually, some stones that go down. It's, it's these would steep. be anything that we would sanction yeah. as a as an agency to promote. It's buyer beware if you want to take the hike down. Any other uh, comments or recommendations for the plan? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the plan? How will we approve the plan provided our comments are either redrawn or incorporated? I think just with that is the case. So, is there a second to the motion? Sorry. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the plan is recommended for approval. Mm -hmm. Item, yeah. second item of new business is recommendation on the vacation of a portion of Gibson Street, West of Graham Avenue, and the dedication of land along the Chippewa River to the city. <coughs> some discussions with this commission in the past but the construction of the Pablo Center uh, we have the and I'll show it in an aerial in a minute here uh, but we have the construction of Haymarket Plaza just to the north of the Pablo Center and then the trail connection uh, along the the north side of the uh, Haymarket Plaza that extends over towards, towards Barstow our plans are to extend the trail now along the uh, east side of the Chippewa River next summer. So basically, it'll, it right now ends about this point here. It'll extend down along the Chippewa River, uh, down past Grand Avenue, all the way down to Lake Street. So uh, with the proposed vacation of uh, Gibson Street here, uh, what the staff is recommending if that goes forward is that uh, we will retain a uh, this parcel of land right here uh, that would be along the river so that we can continue that we can construct that trail uh, along the uh, Chippewa River. Also within this area uh, if this is vacated uh, we 
do not want any uh, building to occur within that area. So uh, we would re want to retain a, uh, basically an easement through this area so that the public uh, walking on Graham Avenue uh, can access the trail uh, going through this area here. Uh, so the, the vacation of this uh, right away would not allow for uh, construction to occur within that area. The, uh, also, uh, what our city attorney has talked about is including a, a view easement so that uh, nothing further could be constructed in this area that would obstruct the view. The, with the construction of the Pablo Center here, as part of that construction, uh, the, the site plan allowed for the, uh, the addition of a, a, uh, a loading dock. Thank you. A loading dock in this area here, and I have a couple of photos showing that loading dock. Uh, by the vacation of this area here, uh, the city would be relieved of any, uh, having to enforce any parking regulations along here. And also it would allow for, the, when the redevelopment occurs in this area here, it would allow for the possibility of a, a driveway connection that would come over uh, to serve this development. Although we have not seen any plans for that at this point in, in time here. So I'll show a couple aerials too that can kind of get a better feel for the uh, area. Uh, so this is a, a, a recent, fairly recent aerial. Again, this would be the Pablo Center. This is the uh, portion of Gypsy Street that we're talking about here tonight. This is the Haymarket Plaza. Uh, the trail, uh, when the Haymarket Plaza is completed, will extend to about this point right here, so that will be completed in the spring. Uh, the pedestrian bridge that was recently opened and dedicated is located right here, so that doesn't actually even show up on this particular map here. And then the trail extends along the, the north side of the Haymarket Landing Building, and our plans are actually to extend that uh, past uh, Barstow over a Farmel Street next summer. You might see plans for that at a future meeting. Uh, so as I mentioned, next summer then the uh, construction of the trail will extend south, so it'll go along this section all the way down, down to Lake Street. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, section of Gibson Street that I took uh, yesterday. Uh, so Graham Avenue is located in the foreground here. This is the Pablo Center. Uh, this is the building to the south uh, that uh, will be part of the redevelopment that will be occurring. So this building will be more than likely removed as part of the redevelopment. Again, I have, we haven't seen plans for that. The uh, loading dock that I referred to is located right here. So actually the loading dock uh, takes up almost half of the right of way right now in terms of being able to actually get through it with the vehicle. Uh, right now cars are able to park along the, the south side here. Here's the uh, loading dock uh, and this was approved as part of the Pablo Center uh, project site plan uh, that went through the, uh, this commission, plan commission and the council. <coughs> uh, the parking on the south side. So the river uh, is located just beyond these barricades here. Our trail will be going uh, right in that vicinity of where those trails are next summer. Building to the south, and then the, the Pablo Center on the north side, and then back to where we are. So this is the area that they are proposing uh, they wish to vacate. As I mentioned then, the, but the the conditions, if this were to go forward, is that we would want to retain an easement uh, for public access uh, for people to be able to go from Graham Avenue over to the trail. Uh, we want to uh, retain a, a view easement so that there's no further uh, uh, blocking or obscuring of the river. And then also, in talking with engineering, uh, they'll want to retain a, a potential utility easement in case at some point in the future, uh, we would want to extend any utilities from there. Uh, with, with that, 
So I, I think one, one of the reasons why this is being requested is that it would allow for uh, uh, buses to be parked in this area for longer than what the two hour limit is currently right now. And then again, it would allow for when this redevelopment occurs for a, a driveway connection uh, with some form of a driveway that would be located in this area possibly to access that development. Again, this is kind of all speculation at this point. Uh, this went to the plan commission on Monday night uh, and they uh, recommended on a, a eight to one vote to uh, support that and then this will go to the council uh, in a future meeting. Um, yeah. What exactly is the vacation typically mean? I don't know what that means from a technical standpoint. Is there there's no transfer of property, but it's no longer a street, or can you just define that a little better? Yes. Let me go back to the Currently, right now, this is considered uh, public right of way. Uh, so it really is not city property, it's not private property. It's, uh, it's like when when these blocks were, were platted and dedicated, they set aside this, uh, this strip of land, Gibson Street basically, as public right of way. So for, for public access, for people for street use, uh, for people to, to use it as they see fit. Uh, what the vacation process uh, is basically, it, uh, it eliminates the, the designation of a public right of way, it becomes basically private property. And what happens is that uh, half the, the north half of this right of way would revert to the ownership of the Pablo uh, property. The south half would revert to the property to the south, so it would split it in the middle. Uh, since it is private property, uh, in terms of the owner of this property and the owner of this property, if they chose to, for example, if, uh, if this owner, uh, for some reason, uh, was interested in buying that north half, uh, they could work with the owners of the Pablo property and purchase that, that north half if they chose to. Uh, but by state law, uh, the way the land was uh, platted, it would be divided down the middle half with one half going to the north side and one half going to the south side. So it would no longer be technically a stream or a different stream within Stop at Graham Avenue and not continue to right. the river. No longer be a street right away. Uh, but as I mentioned, we uh, would still want to uh, retain the ability for the public to be able to use that. So that's why we would uh, require an easement uh, for, for public access. Susan? So if the, one of the main reasons for the Pablo Center to fund this is so that they have the bus parking nearby, I mean, I realize they for sure would want to uh, impede access to their loading docks since that was one of the big um, goals of the project was to be able to load correctly. But if those are for, if that's for buses, would they have trouble turning around? In that? How's that going to work? Is there any issue with buses there? Yeah, I can't answer that for you. I don't know. I don't know if they would, uh, they would just, maybe just back in. If they would just pull in and then, and then have, have They've already been parking house. buses there. They are. Yeah. yeah I've seen like a four, I've had four buses parked there at once. Yeah. They're figuring it out somewhere. Because they, because they are using that, because of the loading dock there, they, they want to be able to, with their buses, a lot of the buses that are coming in or would be coming in would have equipment and that's where the equipment would be unloaded. Oh, okay. So, so it's, it's more than just buses. It would be uh, it could be trucks that would be coming and unloading equipment so, for concerts. So not so much buses for groups that are coming. It, it could be for a, a variety of, of uses. It, is it? Could you show the aerial yep. uh, photograph again? Is it behind that gray building? Isn't that a kind of very informal parking lot right there? Yeah, um, behind, it doesn't go all the way back. This uh, historically has been parking here and then parking here. But again, the, the redevelopment parcel basically would include this area here, uh, not including the riverfront, that will be where the trail is. Um, so 
Terry. Thank you. As I understood it, Pat, at the planning commission meeting, um, that easement would be a minimum of 12 feet wide. Is that right? Yeah, actually, uh, from my understanding, the, the right of way, I think, is 66 feet, either 60 or 66 feet. And, uh, and it's my understanding that the easement would be essentially the full width of all 33. Yep. And then, as far as parking goes, so whatever is designated as the walkway, would they, would they not be able to park? I don't have an answer for that. Much. The uh, because yeah, this is where the cars were parking right now. Uh, if this becomes uh, vacated and becomes private property, um, they would. Soon they'd be able to uh, park there, but they will have to gain some access for for, seat for pedestrians to get through there. And well, if, if, the, if the details of that have been worked out with, uh, with our attorney or not. Uh, just a couple questions. One, just out of curiosity, uh, does that property now get on the tax rolls? Uh, question number two, did the client commission have any, raise any concern though? Was there any issue at all that we should be aware of in terms of why we wouldn't do this? It seems to be kind of the thing from my perspective. But is, what, what are the red flags? Well, in terms of the tax roll, the, the property on the, on the south, the south half would go back, revert back to the tax roll. Uh, I don't know if the Pavel Center is taxable or not. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure on that. Uh, in terms of the uh, what the some of the issues that have been raised is within the downtown plan is that we want to maintain uh, view sheds uh, towards the river, kind of similar to what was talked about with Dunno, where the different streets uh, have uh, view sheds up towards Delphi Pond. Well, in this case here with uh, Gibson, Gibson Street and then with uh, with Grand Avenue and the, uh, other streets. The, the intent is to try to maintain from this area here uh, views of the river. Uh, so uh, we'd have some concerns about vacating this street and then allowing for a, a building to be built on to it, essentially. So uh, by, by maintaining that uh, view easement and then the access easement, uh, that seemed to generally address the concerns of the planning commission. Yeah, that's, uh, it sounds a bit vague, you know. If you want to maintain the view lines and you want to have a public easement and you want to make sure there's no building there, then why not just re retain it as a street? And if they need a, uh, they've already built their loading dock out into the right of way, and it sounds like they're already parking buses there. Maybe we could amend the parking signs on show days or something. But I don't see anything, any advantage for vacating the land. I, and and, and you addressing future issues, look, with no specifics. We don't know what they're, they might have a driveway, they might be this, they might be that. And the city, I just see it's, it's going to lose control of it. And uh, one day there won't be a sight line or a public easement. It does use us for the maintenance obligations for the right street, so we don't have to maintain it anymore. We don't have to plow it in the wintertime. So in that respect, for community services, it releases us from having to maintain the street. At some point, it's going to have to be replaced, and uh, a new service will have to be put on it. So that would really set up obligation for us. Would there be an advantage to leaving things as is until we see a plan from for example, that self-development project. I don't know if that. I don't know when that would be. Yeah. Okay. Um, how many how many downtown parking spaces would be lost to this? Uh, there were eight cars parked there when I took the pictures. We had pretty much capacity. Okay. Maybe nine, but eight eight to nine. I do have a couple other questions. Okay. 
Um, and and now um, the land would go to private ownership, but it wouldn't be sold. Is that right? It wouldn't be sold for. Well, it would go to the the two abutting properties. And the basic would have to, I guess as I mentioned, the potential would be that uh, since this is a, the Moldy Dock on the, like, on the north side, I mean, in theory, the, if this is vacated, the, again, this prop, the south side would go to the south property owner. They could choose, if the Pobble Center wanted to purchase it, uh, they, they could pur purchase that if they wanted to. It's not being purchased from the city, though. That's no. And, and that neighbor, the owner to the south, that's A Market Properties, is it? I don't know the name uh, of, the, of the owner. South. You know, on the south? Yeah. Did I say south? Yeah. Anyway. The property owner to the south, not the Pablo Center. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I believe it's Haymarket Properties. Yeah, that I don't know. Terry? As I understood it, I, I don't think the option of keeping it as a street is, is still available to us because of the loading time that we've already agreed to give Pablo. And the width of the street is it, is it usable as a street? Yeah, but if that's correct. Yeah, as you can see from the photos, the, the loading dock essentially extends half on the north half of the 33 feet, but half the width of that street. So it's it's not really a usable street any longer. It's not a usable street, and it doesn't go anywhere. And you could save money by not maintaining it, but you could say that about any street in the city. <laughs> I would say the city should hold on to it and allow use as as needed. But once you turn it over to uh, Haymarket and they sell their half to Pablo, then it's off the tax rolls and Haymarket profit it. These these ones would still have to be honored. Everything would still stay the same. Uh, well, if you want to keep it the same, then keep it the same. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Um, Jeff? So the memo was addressed to you um, in, in, the, in the packet here. Did the applicants give any reasoning, or do they have to, on why they would like the vacation of the street? No, that, that I mean, the, the memo came from engineering to me. Sure, okay. I don't know if you have any further information than what was I, I don't have any uh, conversation. With would their buses be getting ticketed? Under the current situation, potentially, they could get ticketed. Street vacation, it would be. No, I got just yeah. Just philosophically, I think it's more public policy for a municipality to hang out the property that they don't need. It seems to me we don't need that. The city of Oakland doesn't need that property. If we revert back to the tax rolls, we do have a protection through the easement. We do have protection at the uh, where the uh, end of the street butting the water. Uh, and I, I think we should uh, go with the vacation. There's really no reason for the city to hang on to that. And any real concern, I think, is being protected by uh, the language within the easement. Susan? Well, this potentially wouldn't be a concern in the city, but doesn't the don't those two property owners if the street is vacated, don't the, and they want this to be available for parking of any kind, don't they then inherit the responsibility for getting it cleared out in the winter? Making it clear so that trucks and whereas at this point the city is doing that? That's correct. I'm surprised they want that responsibility. You know, they, it's not something you can do with like shovels. It's, how does that impact the end of the street? The trail will continue to go through there without. That's not good. this vacation is not going to affect that. No. Okay. I have shown on the, uh, the 
the actual, this land will be retained by the city here. Why is there that little, little notch there? I think that's, that's where the loading dock is located. So, so, your attorneys talked about retaining some language so the public could still walk through there, and you told us that you want to retain that view. But is that spelled out in any more detail? So, if we vacate, you know, I mean, how much signage can they put up there? Or, uh, you know, uh, 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 they wouldn't. Uh, I think it's that's something that you could uh, specify in your motion in terms of that. Uh, in terms of li limiting any future signage, that would, or I don't anticipate that would occur. But in part of your motion, you certainly could stipulate that that's a concern. You want to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, in talking with the, again, with the attorneys, they were looking at a, a view easement, which would limit any kind of signage that would be installed there. I don't think our sign code would necessarily allow that to occur either, but uh, by putting that in as part of your motion, I think that helps uh, state what some of your concerns are. Yeah. But I think maybe what you're asking, uh, just like the legal easement will have for utilities, It'll be written into the agreement that the new shed would stay as a visual piece. Okay. Because that gets documented yeah. during the vacation. Well, and then this, uh, and the idea of maintaining public access, what's that like? Is that a three foot sidewalk or is that the, the whole width of it that they have along them and just they want? I don't think the actual easement documents have been brought up yet, so I can't tell you what that would be. And that could be a, a comment in your motion, is that that would be maximized as much as possible uh, to provide that public access. Did you see this through the Planning Commission earlier this week? Or last week? On Monday. On the 4th? On the 3rd. Mm -hmm. That's right. I was trying to see in the minute that it's not listed. The minutes haven't been posted. Okay. Yeah. Is it the River is the working river, and everything backs up to the river. All the back doors are to the river, and there are docks and all the kinds of things. So then that use, that placement got repeated and repeated, even though buildings changed and use changed and so forth. So um, now it, with the <coughs> development of the Pablo Center, it has beautiful views of the river and the plaza will make for a big wide view of the river. But a lot of the other properties that are relatively new, the apartment buildings and so forth, they're backed right up to the river. So before that redevelopment takes place, will you have any ability to say that whatever is built there needs to protect not just walking over to the river, but seeing the river? Because otherwise you just um, you cement the historic blocking of the river from you know, public view. You, you totally change really how you can see the city. Yeah, when we get a uh, development proposal for I mean, this. nobody has come forward and said, I'd like to propose we do this. It's just sitting there, right? It's a possibility. We haven't seen any submittal at this point. But what I guess what I would say is when a submittal is brought in as a site plan, uh, that will come before this commission and the planning commission uh, for review as part of the site plan. So you'll get to see what's being proposed to make sure that they are trying to uh, provide kind of a, a front of that building towards the river. 
I'm just saying this because you can see how hard, if something historically is the back door, it is very hard to turn it around, which is a lot of what we've been doing for you know, 25 or 30 years. It, it, the more it's built in the old way, the harder it is. You just never get there. Well, I'm just saying, again, philosophically, it seems to me that we are the uh, waterways and parks commission. So we're concerned about that little uh, niche that's not lined on that on the easement, right? The rest of the stuff really, that, I mean, we want access to that. It seems to me with an easement, we have access to that. But we're concerned about, I think, access to the Chippewa River. Guarantees that that the access that we have now not going to be any greater, but it will be maintained. Uh, and the commission that is has a greater responsibility for the lined area there has already spoken. Uh, so it just seems to me that I, I'm I'm satisfied that our niche within the government cycle of Eau Claire is being fulfilled by us uh, approving uh, that vacation. Hi. Hi. If I could add, I think that um, generally from the perspective of this commission, like I'd love to see fewer cars on the riverway, just parked on the riverway, and so um, I like that. Um, I wonder, I, I guess moving forward in the process, if for me as council member, it would be helpful to hear from the applicants um, I, this is not within the purview of this commission, so I'm going to be looking for this, but um, I, um, losing eight parking spots, I think that is, like parking that is needed in the city, um, and we hear that all the time, and so um, I would, you know, I'm not opposed to it, it's just something that I would want to hear, like a compelling reason for, from the applicant for why that is happening, so, but I, and I think in the purview of this commission, you know, getting, getting cars, not parking as close to the river and draining whatever they drain is a good idea. So. That's that's going to be on the city council agenda for uh, Monday for public hearing. Unless they take it off. They have to take it off. They take it off. Okay. Susan. And we we would have we would have been first, right? Because that's the more usual order. We look at things and then it goes to the plan commission and then it goes to the city council. It's because we moved our the date that we're after the plan commission. That, that's part of it. In this particular case, uh, both the plan commission and this commission are making recommendations uh, or the council is making the final decision. So in a perfect world, we would have brought this to you before the planning commission. <coughs> Being that both commissions are making recommendations, we felt that we could uh, handle it separately. And on November, December, we've got to combine it in one. So yeah. this is an atypical I need to date for this. So just to kind of follow up something I asked earlier, like, it would be nice if they said why <coughs> on the vacation, but they're not required to do so, or Maybe they did, but it just hasn't been ordered to this commission to yeah, the rationale. My okay. understanding is a request from the applicants that they, uh, as Pat was saying, the loading docks are taken up or the path of the roadway already from the previous agreement for the public center. Um, and it was a request from the applicants that they were looking at obtaining that. Is there any further discussion on this? Topic. Seeing none, the, uh, is there a motion to approve the vacation of this portion of the Gibson Street? I so move. Tom, is there a second? I'll second. Ron, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Oh. No. Uh, can we re-vote by a show of hands, please? Uh, once again, all in favor? Raise your hand. And those opposed? Three. Okay, motion passes six to three. Uh, next item of business is the 2018 special events list. 
All right, uh, we're down to the end of the year. Uh, we had 108 special events applied for this year in the city of Oakland. Uh, most recently, the Clearwater Parade and Let It Go uh, was held on last Friday. Um, we estimated that there was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 people that, that uh, uh, attended. Again, two years in a row, we've had uh, very large crowds. Christmas time in the city was held on uh, the 1st of December, which was Saturday, downtown Eau Claire, and I believe that was the lighting of the uh, Christmas tree uh, in the Haymarket Plaza area. Uh, Run Santa Run was held on Sunday in Phoenix Park, and our last uh, special event for the year is the New Year's Eve lighted up Eau Claire, which we did uh, down in the downtown Eau Claire. So another very uh, busy year for us. It's hard to believe that we're coming to an end, but uh, certainly we had a lot of uh, successes with special events this year. And more to come, I understand the Blue Angels are coming back in 2020. So. Any questions on the special events? Why do you so many times before the July? I feel like. Well, they. Do you know that Blue Angels are here often for the 4th of July? And well, this one's like, in June. No, but oh, so you said June. Okay. June. They're here for the 4th of July. No, okay. and it'll be back again in 2020. Okay. But it'll be in June. Okay, June, not July. Okay. Yeah. Not I, thought July. Was just, yeah. I thought it was just a lot of luck. That was, a, July. That, was a, that was a very tough time that came through because we have our Missionary Zone and plus we have the Blue Angels. So. Or do the same week as the music festival again? Um, it'll be June. Uh, second, second, second weekend of June. That's it. Third time. <laughs> yeah. So they should make the campground another five zone. Okay. Okay, that's all for the special events list. We will move to the director's reports. Okay, um, for the parks division, we had um, our uh, ribbon cutting ceremony at the uh, our newest dog park on the north side in Sunday Park area. Uh, we had several dogs and their owners there. I want to thank uh, Councilmember Mel for being there and uh, enjoying the festivities with us. Uh, we have a knack when we pick these ribbon cuttings. It's usually the coldest day of, uh, of the week. And we did not disappoint again. It was cold, but uh, it was fun watching the dogs socialize. It was, uh, and I've been out there a couple times since, and Certainly, um, it's it's interesting to see the dogs just go. And, you know, and it's a large area. We have nine acres out there, and um, it, it's really neat to watch. So, again, that our newest one, I think, it's uh, turning out to be a very very big success. Um, we have our third annual archery deer hunt in the uh, November 10th and 11th in the. Wellfield. Uh, this year we harvested seven deer, which included five bucks and two goats. And this, as I mentioned, third year of the youth hunt. Again, when we had this, it's youth and disabled hunters. They're being mentored and uh, <coughs> chaperoned by the Chippewa Valley bow hunters. So again, we're using uh, bows out there. Um, today we harvested 26 deer in, in the Wellfield. Uh, in our attempt to try to uh, reduce the size of the herd that we have in this field. So I know it's tough. Uh, we can't hunt on private land, but we do have a list of hunters that if someone does want to have uh, uh, <coughs> some assistance with hunting, uh, we have that online. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, as far as Carson Park goes, our uh, parks maintenance crews have already completed the move of the bleachers from the football field back to the baseball field. Um, in addition, we uh, had a contractor come and we have uh, the, the cap on the baseball stadium has been deteriorating and so we're about 90% through with that. And I believe, Todd, will that be finished in the spring? That's the goal. Okay. Um, so, if the contractor gets weather favorable to doing masonry work, he'll, he'll um, pump it up and the pile and put heat to it and maybe then before some 
said tapping into the roof. On the, on the very top where the support from the roof comes down, that there's a the top of the cap that goes the wall. Yeah. Oh, okay. And that was deteriorating. You know, we, we wanted to make sure we, we took care of that before we had some other structural change. It was, it was part of the you know, design, an imperfection of design of the railings, the guard railings, had penetrations into that concrete cap. Of course, the water finds those over years. And I'm starting to pull that out. So this, these are precast concrete sections. And then our, our railing now is not penetrating that cap. It's, well, it is actually penetrating the surface, more of a surface mount railing rather than, you know, the sleeve mount. So with caulk and baccarat and, and you know, careful inspection annually, Cap is the same color as the stone. It's a paint. It'll be painted. It's it's the teal color paint that can. We restored the way it was before. And the bleachers were replaced, weren't we? Uh, talking about buildings and new seating that, along the side there. That's still being fundraised for. Uh, we're in the midst of uh, design on that. Uh, we're actually getting close to. I would say probably many percent design on that. That will be coming to this commission uh, on the completion of the design plan. Again, that's another project that's being fundraised uh, as a 50% uh, of that. They're fundraising 50% of the So it won't be ready for opening day. Oh, no. no, no. <laughs> In order for that to happen, is that we're going to have to start construction uh, right away in August. That might happen this year, though. Is it next year? No. The money is there. Again, we don't start the projects until we have the money. Okay. Um, as far as Forest Street Division, tree planting, uh, the fall street planting is finished up as of November 14th. And we were focused primarily on street reconstruction projects, uh, some of our street reconstruction went a little bit later this year. Uh, we did finish them, so we're not, uh, uh, we're not having to plow on gravel streets, but uh, so we got that done. And so we were getting caught up on that. Uh, we've talked a lot about Emerald Ash Corps. We're, we're continuing that effort to uh, uh, treat and also uh, mitigate any of the Emerald Ash Corps trees. And that's also, we've talked about that many times where we working together with community services from taking the trees down, uh, uh, taking out the stumps, and then replanting them the lower ground. So that, that effort is going to continue until we got the emerald uh, or the ash trees to a point that we're not going to have any uh, major issues with them breaking uh, apart. Uh, our forestry crews have completed the cleanup and clearing of our cross country ski trails, and as soon as we get uh, snow, we'll start grooming. So things are parting up good, so we just need some snow. I think we need at least a six to eight inch base to typically that's and get it six inches. To solid. I work off of that base. Center. Um, as far as recreation, we talked about the Clearwater Parade again. Very successful year again. I, I see this this event actually getting bigger and bigger. There's a lot of energy downtown. Certainly, uh, uh, get a lot of nice coverage in the newspaper and on the TV, and a lot of first time uh, people that have come to the parade. So they they're going to make it a family tradition. So it's a, it's a deep opportunity. So the weather helped. Yeah. Weather helped. <laughs> Last two years we've had. Uh, you can afford that. Holy really moly, I went out here with my son. Bro, it was. Oh, well, the year before that. Two years, yeah. oh, two years so ago. Two years so ago. Two years ago. But certainly the last two years that we've had this. And okay. We're keeping it towards that end of uh, November, early December, trying to get that. So um, if we had it this coming up, we could. So just a weekend later, this weekend, I think the high's going to be in the, in the 20s. The low would be minus four. <laughs> so. And then again, the prime times uh, uh, 
it's out there. So, so maybe something you utilize if you want to sign up for any type of our, any of our programs that we have. Any other questions or comments for the group? Seeing none, I'll take a motion to adjourn. I will move. Second. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between Newsworks and the City of Eau Claire. A transcript of this meeting is available for the hearing impaired. It will be available within seven days of this telecast. Call 715-839-4912 or TDD 715-839-1689 or write Eau Claire City Clerk, P.O. Box 5148, Eau Claire, Wisconsin 54702-5148. Newsworks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715-839-5067 or online at valleymediaworks.org.